Okay, so I'm going to start the webinar now. Here we go. Okay, so I'm going to start the webinar. All right. Good, good evening, everybody. I was about to say good morning, but this is one of our, e our evening sessions. So thanks for joining us today. Uh, welcome to the penultimate session for the Mindful Modernisms webinar series. And thanks for joining us. My name is Kurt Esperson-Peters, and I'll be introducing the webinar uh, session for today. Mindful Modernisms are eight webinars and a series of cross-cultural and interdisciplinary discussions organized by academic initiatives, which is a collaboration between the Canadian Centre for Mindful Habitats, the Bachelor of Interior Design Program at Algonquin College, and the Department of Interior Design at the University of Manitoba for the promotion of critical, mindful, and contemplative approaches in design thinking, education, and practice. For the Mindful Modernism series, the discussions are centered on mindfulness as a mode of inquiry to challenge assumptions about modernism and the lingering search for modern forms that remain embedded and often invisible in our social, cultural, political, and economic structures. We are especially interested in the intersection between mindful modernism and modern mindfulness in our built and designed environments in terms of design thinking, education, and practice. The goal is to remove the speakers from their normal interdisciplinary and professional comfort zones and through a discussion and dialogue, have them bring their insights and intellect to bear on generating new ideas and possibilities about modernism and mindfulness in the allied and non-allied fields of design and the built environment. And we anticipate these sessions to always be dynamic, generative and informative, both for the speakers and the attendees. The series is supported by the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada and Interior Designers of Canada and partially funded by the Ontario Association of Architects and the grant from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. We'd also like to thank each of our generous presenters for their time and effort in making this series happen, as well as the numerous students research assistants who have assisted us along the way. This series is co-curated by Pallavi Swaranjali, myself and Roger Connor. And Mindful Modernisms is part of an ongoing series of webinars, publications, studio and seminar courses, and exhibitions organized by academic initiatives and the Canadian Centre for Mindful Habitats on the investigation of critical mindfulness in design thinking, education, and practice. For more information on how on our project and how to get involved, please contact us. And we'll be placing contact information in the chat window below. I'll now pass over the introduction to today's uh, session to our moderator, Pallavi Swarajali. Pallavi is a full-time faculty in the Bachelor of Interior Design program at Algonquin College. She has a BA in architecture, an M design in industrial design from India, and a PhD in architecture from Carleton University. Her research centers on the relationship between architecture and storytelling, looking at non-conventional modes of architectural representation that combine the normative and the fantastical and the ways in which they meaningfully transform architectural making and experience. She is a coordinator of the Carleton Research Practice of Teaching Collaborative and one of the founding members of the Canadian Centre for Mindful Habitats. Pallavi, I hand this over to you. Thank you so much, Kurt, and uh, welcome Vikram and Peter. We are very delighted to have you today with us. And welcome to everyone who has joined today, either here on this webinar on, or on uh, our YouTube channel. Uh, I would like to introduce our very distinguished speakers today. Uh, I'll start with uh, Vikram. Uh, Dr. Vikram Maditya Prakash is an architect, architectural historian and theorist 
He is Professor of Architecture at the University of Washington with adjunct appointments in landscape architecture, in urban design and planning, and in digital arts and experimental media. He is also a member of the South Asia program in the Jackson School of International Studies. Uh, Vikram received his BARC from Chandigarh College of Architecture in India and his MA and PhD in History of Architecture and Urbanism from Cornell University, Ithaca, in New York. Vikram works on issues of modernism, post-coloniality, global history and fashion and architecture. Um, his books include Chandigarh's Le Corbusier, The Struggle for Modernity in Post-Colonial India, A Global History of Architecture, Colonial Modernities, The Architect Architecture of Shiv Dutt Sharma, Chandigarh, An Architectural Guide, and more recently, One Continuous Line, Art, Architecture, and Urbanism of Aditya Prakash, as well as Global uh, Modernisms that, that has been recently uh, published. Um, Sorry, um, Vikram is also Associate Dean for Academic Affairs in the College of Built Environments. He also directed Chandigarh uh, Urban Lab, a series of interdisciplinary internationally, international studios. He's a co-PI of three successive grants, one in 2014, one in 2016, and the last in 2019, uh, awarded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation which resulted in the creation of GAHTC, um, a collective of over 200 teachers of global architectural history. He's also host of Architecture Talk, a bi-weekly podcast based on curated conversations with invited guests. Vikram is co-design lead of the R, Office of Uncertainty Research. R is being exhibited in the 2021 Venice Architectural Biennale and also in 2021 European Cultural Center exhibit both in Venice. Vikram was recognized as the AXA Distinguished Professor by the Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture in 2021 for his career achievements. Thank you Vikram for joining us today. Peter, uh, Peter Scriber, who is our second speaker today, is a founding member of the Center for Asian and Middle Eastern Architecture at the University of Adelaide, where he has taught modern architectural history, theory and design, and directed postgraduate research since 1996. Scriber is a critical authority on the architectural history of modern India. His theoretical interests focus on cultural and coordinated relationships between architecture, building planning, and urban design, and the institutional frameworks and professional networks in which these disciplines operate. In addition to his pioneering works on post-colonial India, Scriver is also an expert on colonial modernity. His extensive historical research on the British Ind Indian Department of Public Works um, has examined its instrumental role in the propagation and institutionalization of modern architectural and engineering knowledge in colonial India and beyond. His ongoing works on transnational professional networks and exchanges of architectural knowledge and expertise between Australia and Asia in particular, continues to contribute to critical scholarship on colonial and modern architectural history and the broader cultural, institutional, and political economic frameworks of its pro production. So with that introduction, I would uh, like to hand it over to our first speaker, uh, who is Vikram. And how this webinar series is structured is we'll have back-to-back -back presentations by our speakers, and then we will uh, have a conversation and question answer from the audience as well. Uh, after the presentations are over. So it's over to you, Vikram. Welcome again. Uh, thank you, Pallavi and Kurt. So excited to be doing this in a transcontinental mode. A, because of this superb topic that you have uh, instituted. And secondly, because I'm very happy to be uh, sharing this platform with my good, good friend, Peter Scriber whom we have done many things together uh, and I'm excited to be on this thing to, uh, uh, trans, transnationally. Okay, 
And what I'm going to essentially present is uh, what I did for this is, uh, can you see, am I sharing properly? Yeah. Yes. So uh, I have, I, I looked at the introductions of three or four books I've recently written and culled text from each one of them. So what I'm presenting to you is a collage. So let's see how this goes. Oh, the word global in the title of my co-authored textbook, A Global History of Architecture, is not so much a geographic construct as an erudational horizon, which is the idea that the local is also inevitably imbued with the not local. The movement of people's ideas and wealth has bound us to each other since the beginning of history. What if we had never started migrating out of Africa? What would the Turks be today had they stayed in East Asia or the Mughals in Mongolia? In that sense, that textbook is not about the sum of all local histories. Rather, its mission is to see connections, tensions, and associations that both describe and transcend the local, regional, and national. Oh, I was supposed to be on this slide, but anyway, that's where we are. Our post 19th century penchant to see history through the lens of the nation state and the geographic region often makes it difficult to decipher such pictures. Furthermore, in face of today's increasingly hegemonic global economy, the tendency by historians and often enough by architects to nationalize, localize, regionalize, and even micro regionalize history, perhaps as meaningful acts of resistance, can blind us to the dangers of localizations, such as the neo-nationalisms we are witnessing today. It was with this in mind that my forthcoming global history of the architecture of the Indian subcontinent both locates geography, the Indian subcontinent, and questions it as its constraining trait. It emphasizes the movement of ideas in and out of that geography as also within it as it does the specificity and particularity of those ideas. The flow of Indian Buddhism to China, the opening of trade to South Asia, the settling of Mongolians in the North, the influx of Islam from the East, and the colonization by the English are just some of the more obvious, most obvious links that bind the Indian continent for better or for worse to global events. It is as much these links and the result architecture in as much these links as the resultant architecture as the Indianness of Indian architecture that interests me. In these rethinkings of the grand narratives of history, my goal has been to help students of architecture develop an understanding of the manner in which architectural production is always triangulated by exigencies of time and location. This is what might be called mindful historiography. More specifically, I underscore what we consider to be the inevitable modernity of each period. And this is perhaps what can be called modern mindfulness, what Kurt referred to. We often think of the distant past as moving slowly from age to age, dynasty to dynasty or king to king, and only of our recent history as moving at a faster pace. In such a teleological view, the modern present is at the apex of civilization and history becomes a narrative of progress that is measured against the values of the contrast by the, of the present. By contrast, I have tried to present every period in history in terms of its own challenges in the history of architecture as the history of successive and often dramatic change spurred on by new materials, technologies, changing political situations, and changing aesthetics and religious ideas. In the global history of the architecture of the Indian subcontinent, I have positioned my narrative in dialogue with that of the story of India movies created by Michael Wood of BBC, in which he emphasizes in an unapologetically neocolonial way, the persistent presence of the past in the present. By contrast, I insist on emphasizing the persistent presence of the present in the past, an idea that should give us pause before we assume that we are here today, that we here today are unique and special as compared to the pasts. And this is perhaps a way to think about mindfulness. For several decades now, and now turning to modernism directly, for several de decades now, certainly since the 1980s, but perhaps in the 60s, 
The task of unlinking the history of modern architecture from the precepts and preconditions of colonialist Eurocentrism has been an ongoing process. This is a multi-pronged, multi-tiered effort that is perforce as of yet incomplete and ongoing. In the 19th and 20th century, in the so to speak a days of modernism, its historiography driven by its interested historiographers was invested in constructing a unified causal and determinedly teleological picture of modern architecture. Those historians presented modern architecture as something like an inevitable consequence of hysterical event, historical events, championed and heralded by avant-garde mod modernist masters and their equally avant-gardist clients, clearly indexed to rationality, science, and the march of progress. Both universal and particularized modern architecture was proselytized as an evolutionary product of a particular European history, even as it was simultaneously a repudiation of that history. If the above feels like a caricature of the actual history of modern architecture and its many conscientious historiographers, it is because my purpose with my co-editors and authors uh, in, that, in this book, uh, in, in, le in leading with it was not to firmly nail this as an indictment on the door of the church of modernism, but rather to emphasize the, em emphasize the impulse to unify, to singularize and universalize that has dogged modern architecture, even as its actual inscription into global history has been sig significantly differentiated, diverse and multivalent. Indeed, this impulse to unify and singularize in the face of differentiation and division can be seen as one of modern architecture's constitutive contradictions. Think for instance of Le Corbusier's gigantic door that he painted for the ceremonial entrance of the assembly building he was just completing in Chandigarh, India. Um, I, I, I'm not sure how familiar you are with this, but once Le Corbusier reached Chandigarh, uh, he found himself designing in the fantastic conditions of the post-colonial condition and took upon the sort of rural agro landscape that he was faced with uh, and converted that into an aspirational, a very aspirational vision of a, a, a what one might call utopian modernism, which he encapsulated in this door on the left-hand side as a agricultural, agro-pastoral landscape with sort of a green field with a sort of idealized tree in the middle, rivers, animals, uh, precipitation, uh, and, uh, and, and, and a, a singular heroic male uh, with a spirit guiding him, uh, showing the path forward into a life in harmony uh, under the sun. So, uh, Le Corbusier's vision of Chandigarh, as scholars well know by now, was astonishingly aspirational, reflecting perhaps the desires of his client Jawaharlal Nehru, India's first erudite prime minister, and his own extremely optimistic aspirations for a newly independent post-colonial India. Thus, while utopian aspirations played a constitutive role in the making of Chandigarh, the forces and vac vectors that actually instituted and institutionalized the city, which is to say made it happen, and then influenced its direction and destiny were by contrast fractious and diverse. The racial politics of the colonial world had established the foundation for its inception as a new city. Its characterization as a model city was derived from colonial model towns intended both as model models for natives as also sites for radical experimentation for the colonialists. Mahatma Gandhi's radical vision of as an India of ashrams had shaped the work of Albert Meyer, Chandigarh's first initial planner. A series of accidents beginning with the Nazi invasion of Poland brought about the city's first architect, Matthew Novicki, to the site and then removed him from the project via a plane crash. The residual efforts of the master slave dialectic brought two Indian civil servants to Europe where they successfully engaged four European architects to lead the team to design the city. A list of such complex factors can go on, but the picture quickly becomes clear. While the presented affect of a project like Chandigarh's capital may be that of an aspirational vision, its actual history 
constitutes a narrative that one might describe as being its global history, a complex concatenation of critical and accidental forces uh, that brought it into being. The particular not, particularities notwithstanding, the general circumstances here were not particular to Chandigarh or its special inheritance. All modernist projects, indeed all projects, are subtended by equally diverse and complicated circumstances. In our book, Daniel Costlet, Mariskella, Kosciato, and I uh, juxtaposed Carbuzier's vision with that of Julie Mehrutu's migration direction map, which is the image on the right, an image of the agencies and desires of migration as a graphic that describes the underlying surrounding global history. Uh, so this map over here, she, she's, she, it, it's like a drawing which tends to trace out what she calls migration maps. So, you know, with all these arrows and directions of movements. Uh, unlike Kabuzia's biaxial and centered painting, which is Mehrutu's drawing outlines and illustrates a disaggregated map of organic entities, a multitude of small but purposeful agential events, each of which are indicated by directional arrows. One assumes that each one of our spatial events has a distinct identity of, it, of its own, and almost all of them intersect with at least one another. Those yet to overlap based on their indicated flows appear on collision course. But overall, as a whole picture, Mehrutu's map outlines a geography of desire that while it is purposeful and directional, does not add up to a single destination or privileged focus. One sees a coherent narrative with many threads, but one without a unifying clear destination or final climax. The relationship between Kabuzia's door and Mehrutu's map is not just that of providing additional context and detail around the main event. Rather, it is about setting up the framework by which we can tell the story differently and more mindfully. If Kabuzia's painting is designed to represent a self-assured utopian vision of the possibilities and promises of modernist thinking, Mehrutu's drawings overlaid upon it, or is it underlaid beneath? Uh, that self-assuring vision points to the multitudes of smaller diachronous and synchronous negotiations, transfers, translations, interpretations, reinterpretations, imitations, and contentions between actors, agents, agents and agencies, institutions and institutionalizations that have to have occurred to make such a project possible. These occurrences are the actual causations upon which then retrospectively, or as was often the case with modernist historiography, proactively more simplified ideological investment narratives can be superimposed. In reading Mehrutu's drawing as an allegorical map of agencies that actuated a global history of modern architecture, our intention was not to simply substitute it for the more localized and idealized maps such as those offered by Le Corbusier's door. Rather, our provocation is to ask what might be considered to be the mindful question, what is the relationship between these two maps? How are they entangled? And how indeed is it that one is productive of the other, of the other and how might it be otherwise? In my book, One Continuous Life, how am I doing for time? You're, you're doing good. Okay, all right, I have just another page and a half. Uh, in my book, One Continuous Line, the art, architecture, and urban of Aditya Prakash, I examine the question of the first generation in question of the first generation Indian modernist, Aditya Prakash's relationship with the masters, Le Corbusier, Pierre Genet, Jane Drew, Buckminster Fuller, Nehru Gandhi, and his sense of his own identity as an orbital, orbital agent in terms of the question of post-colonial agency and its persistent longing for recognition. So here I, you know, I'm bringing this in, simply having laid out that previous map, talking about one of the vectors of uh, desire, which is the vector of recognition in a asymmetrical world. 
Given that Prakash's work is closely identified as belonging to the modernist canon, even if it in dispute with it at times, it is impossible to conduct an assessment of its legacy without locating it within the normative hierarchies of modernism with its deep investment in masters and their ateliers of excellence, all of which are claimedly located in the West. In post-colonial theory, this is identified as the metropolitan modeling of the world, a legacy of colonialism by which the West with its heroes of original thinkers is constructed as the mythologized center of an international discourse whose margins are constituted by the rest based on models of influence and derivation, influence and derivation. In architectural theory, we can recognize this in discourses such as critical regionalism or tropical modernism by which a set of supposedly universal principles inevitably originating in the metropolitan West are centralized and verified precisely by the ways in which they are regionalized, localized or particularized in the peripheries of the world. Critics of this center periphery discourse imagine it in a more decentered form in the shape of a differentiated, uh, in a more decentered form in the shape of a differentiated global network of interconnected interconstitutive agencies acting relationally. These reimaginings variously coded under monikers such as transnationalism, global cosmopolitanism, translocalism, and global history and such. And I'm not, you know, I wonder how one might enter mindful modernist histories into this uh, lexicon. Uh, offer ways to rethink the work of architects such as Aditya Prakash and architectural events such as Chandigarh in something other than a center periphery model. In search of such a diffractive post-humanist model, I have argued in this book that global modern modernism is not a source of ideas that spread out from the West to the rest of the world, but a di diffractive concatenation of practices around the world that inter inter interacted and interacted and continue to interact with each other as this bounce around the architecture corners of the discursive and material worlds of modernism. Diffraction here was a key term for me in that it offered a way to describe the, describe the way two entities, that is to say ideas and their manifestations, uh, do not interact with each other causally, that is ideas cause form, but interact, interact with each other, that is they constitute each other via their interaction. In the same way, architects engage with each other, not via the normative modes of collision or collaboration, but rather as mutually constitutive onto subjectivities. There wasn't a known Aditya Prakash that interacted with a certain Le Corbusier and a Pierre Chenere on the plains of Chandigarh and transformed as a consequence. Rather, the only Prakash and Chenere and Le Corbusier that we know and we can know are the ones that were produced and continue to be produced by their diffraction in the process of working in the capital project office and in narratives that follow subsequently, including let's say a presentation such as this. It is also the image as a process, oh, I have some typo here. Anyway, I'll just read it. it as a process to begin to, this is also an image as a process to begin to think about the story of modernism in a world as a historical cultural happening connected to and like all other historical cultural processes. This, is just, this does not deny hierarchies and the play of powers such as power in such processes. Indeed, they are replete with them and in some ways structured by them. Rather, this is a way to think about the aesthetic of agencies like Prakash in a global register in something other than an origin and influence model. So that's what I have to offer. Uh, uh, it's, it's a cut paste job from seven or eight books uh, that I have tried to weave together into one continuous thread narrative. And I will hand the baton to uh, Peter here. Thank you, Vikram. That was uh, a very provoking uh, presentation. We'll come back to some of the ideas that you discussed here, very interesting ones. Uh, but Peter, the floor is now yours. Okay, thank you. I'll just share my screen.
Okay. Well, is everybody seeing that screen there? Yeah. All right. Well, I'm very uh, delighted and honored and a little humbled um, in this occasion to be following my dear colleague uh, Vikram with his, uh, you know, his fascinating rumination on on recent on the most recent projects. I, I there's there's two. Two new books um, here, in addition to the last one we spoke of, which uh, I'm I'm not so directly aware of, which we'll obviously have to talk about more of. But uh, it's been a wonderful introduction to this topic that you've asked us both to engage on, and this is what we share as colleagues whose careers are have been in close parallel for, as we've reflected a few times recently, for better part of a quarter century already. Um, and in my own way, uh, particularly because of relationships that I have with, with Vikram, who, um, at least in terms of their origins as scholars working on uh, South Asia, the, the, the Indian subcontinent, uh, have in my mind this sort of, um, this challenge to me as to, you know, who, who's, whose voice is mine to, to be talking about the same place and to, to aspire to some sort of, uh, degree of knowledge and, and, and critical mindfulness, to use your term, this uh, series uh, about talking about that region. So it's always uh, very fruitful um, and uh, critically invigorating to, to engage with, with, with Vikram in such discussions. So I'm going to do, um, as you've seen already from uh, the, the, the label I've given to my little discourse for the next 20 minutes, uh, Something that actually goes right to one of the things Vikram said right at the outset is 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 what we perhaps learned need to learn to be wary of. Uh, one of the tropes of recent or, or or scholarship in the in the modern era, um, which uh, particularly in in recent political times, uh, even those that are with us right now have have reverted to the local. Um, and have been stuck um, in many ways in, in the, the, the highly problematic space of the national. I'm going to hopefully make it very clear that I, I'm not interested in the national, but I will be proposing to talk about history and historiography um, in the very local and its merits. I just want to put out here and, I, and I admit that this is, this is a hastily put together presentation uh, for context. I've only just returned from a, uh, a trip to the other side of the planet. I'm speaking to uh, everyone here from Adelaide in Australia, where I have uh, lived and taught for the last quarter century. But uh, I originate from Canada where uh, this series is being put together um, and uh, have just been back in the post or hopefully post COVID context for the first time in two years to be with ancient parents uh, and their issues um, and have been looking very closely at, at my roots circumstantially in recent days. So this is a bit of a reflection on this dual life that one leads, leads in, our, in our modern and uh, highly globalized world, which we've had this, this thought provoking uh, sort of mindful interregnum in the last two years, which has been difficult to live in physically, spatially, but uh, I'm sure we've all been doing much thinking about it. Now I've just had that sort of momentary return, which has made me uh, very thoughtful about some things, I hope. The points I wanna put down uh, in terms of position statements relevant to the, to the thematic of this webinar is first of all, how I think, and, and as I'll demonstrate in the latter part of my presentation, teach uh, history. I mean, what is history? Uh, it is, in a word, it's about change. It's about understanding how, why, perhaps when things change with uh, the recognition, if we think about it, that things are changing in some ways, often very subtle, sometimes dramatic all the time. So it's also equally about when, why, and perhaps how uh, they may not change, which is really quite extraordinary if you think of it. Why would things not change with all the beatings of butterflies' wings and every 
little instance of, of action and agency that uh, are constantly happening from all the beings in this world, how, how is it possible that things could be the same? Um, but sometimes um, that will to reproduce and to, res to restrain, uh, perhaps that was what Rickham was referring to um, in some ways about this, this, this concern about the, the local as imagining that it's something that you know, might always be what it is, it is what it is. Is that really a possibility? Um, but history helps us understand how this uh, this desire, this this belief, this imagination that things are as they are, or always always was, always will be, um, is is something that, that we as humans think about and sometimes desire. So the other key action term here. Um, in terms of this, this, this discourse is to recognize that what Vikram and I do professionally as academics is we are historiographers. We, we, we participate in historiography. That is the study, the writing of, and of course the teaching of, of what history is, uh, of history as, as, a, as a perspective on being. Um, and, in this case, the action word is, is storytelling, which is in the introductions we reminded is, is Pallavi's primary interest in, the, in the, the way we tell stories about the things we believe or imagine or desire. So understanding in, in the, the professional and, and academic sense with, with, with critical rigor, with awareness, with, with uh, an academic mindfulness uh, about the importance of storytelling and the, and again, to reflect on Vikram's fascinating brief presentation that we just heard, the multiplicity of, the inevitable multiplicity and complexity of stories that combine to construct the narratives um, that we call history um, is, is what we, we do, what I do, what I strive to do as consciously and mindfully as I can. Um, and so if we think again about what it means to act historiographically, to produce uh, the, the, the histories that we publish, to teach the lectures or to present these webinars that we are engaging in now, we are constantly constructing, reflecting on and constructing and delivering in some way or form a story here and now in the present, which tells us everything about what perhaps the, the everyday uh, perception of history of the, the common person is that, you know, it, it is what it is, it was, and therefore is the history. Of course, we're constantly contesting that. We're constantly telling it, no, uh, history is what we make of it now in the present. And in a sense of this presence of mind from whatever position or uh, argument we may be taking up to present that story in, in this moment. Uh, it's making history, uh, literally by, by, by writing it, by, by, by telling it. And it is not, and it perhaps arguably is never the history of something. It is a history. Even when we, as many of us who've taught architectural history uh, in the discipline of architecture, you know, we'll constantly refer at some point in our lectures to the uh, canonical and highly problematic uh, first great history text of Bannister Fletcher, which infamously uh, from our perspective in the late 20th century and early 21st century as, as teachers in the, the generation of post-colonial theorists, we always looked at the frontispiece that said the tree of architecture to define this, this uh, seemingly monolithic idea of, of what the history of architecture was, but even Bannister Fletcher was wise enough to say a history, um, as he indicated by the comparative method, his approach to understanding and explaining at that moment, at the peak of empire, how it seemed that certain histories had dominated or had resulted in architectures that were more modern, so to speak, than others. Um, so these uh, I guess the, the closing point on, on this question of historiography is that they, it's the point that they're at the bottom of my list, uh, the historicity 
of past facts, if we accept that there are things that are in fact true or can be demonstrated by the, the, the methods of, of evidence uh, to be things we could give factual status to. They are only um, historical uh, in terms of the historicity we give them, the, the, the facts we choose to bring into our telling of a story in the present telling, uh, which means that the same array, uh, sort of infinite array of historical information that's out there um, can produce radically different stories, um, narratives, uh, depending on the point of view. Now, hopefully this is all um, clear and, 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 and obvious to, to our listeners who are sophisticated members in many cases, perhaps of our own discipline. So I hope I haven't been too too uh, pedantic uh, in, in spelling this out, but it's kind of a statement of faith and, and, a, and the sort of thing that one rehearses, uh, I do at least whenever I meet another undergraduate class year to year and, and try to enthuse them with why sitting in a, in a, in a course on the history of architecture um, is going to be something they will value, uh, something that hopefully they will not just value, but they will actually get perhaps provoked by and excited by uh, in the doing. So um, just trust I'm still seeing, you're still seeing my screen here. I'm just got my screen all cluttered up with stuff here. Um, so what I want to proceed to now and conscious of time is, is quickly just pass over that point I began with that I've just been back um, in my own uh, family basement in Montreal, um, helping elderly parents and other family members to begin to figure out what to do with all that stuff that represents uh, our family life and uh, ancestors and long departed elders whose materials have accumulated in the hands of my, my uh, 90 odd year old parents generation for us to do something in the, in the days going forward. So I feel a certain empathy and, and, and uh, a more acute awareness um, with Vikram's last book that he just touched on in a very selfless way. Of course, he was talking about his own father, uh, Aditya Prakash. And if those of you who've had a chance to read this wonderful book, hopefully you will, uh, you'll see the, the great um, care and, and method of Vikram's approach, which I would call um, the, the, the method of, uh, of a mindful subjectivity um, as a method that's been a feature of much of Vikram's work. Uh, going back to his first major book on Chandigarh much earlier in his career, where uh, he recognized as many in our generation of that we, we, we must acknowledge our subjectivity, we must acknowledge the agency of the interlocutor in in the telling of the narrative, and if we aspire to be good academics, you know that that's that's a given. But it was often uh, ostensibly removed in the the or the ostensible objectivity of previous generations to suggest that there was some sort of imperious possibility of looking at something from outside. Um, in Vikram's book, he's engaged his his students and colleagues in a fascinating way to kind of look at the the archive of of his father's work and, and uh, the materials associated with it in, with, with their own independent eye, but then he offers his own, his own narrative uh, as an interwoven, uh, italicized um, account, uh, often from the child's eyes memory of being that person's uh, offspring living in that same milieu with some of those same artifacts uh, who inevitably saw it from a very particular point of view. And I just had the sort of joy and the, the poignancy and the kind of self-reflectivity of, of being again that child myself amongst my own um, family's stuff, the questions of what to do with that stuff, um, the question of whether anyone else should care or, or what it could mean to those who don't have that, that sentimental inside understanding of it. But recognizing, particularly as I was doing this, um, in, in the body of the framework of my own house, which I've been very fortunate to be able to go back to 25, half a century after I've left Canada, my parents are still living in the same house I grew up in. Uh, this is a rare thing perhaps in North American society. 
that one has had such the luxury of such stability, even though I've had the, the benefit of a, of a global, so to speak, um, academic career where I've lived in various places in the world at different times. I can still go back to that cell, that space, particularly those interiors of the house I've always known and somehow feel like I'm, I'm, I'm back in that same childhood time frame. It hasn't really changed so much in some ways with re respect to those artifacts. And to think about how architecture in this sense uh, is this, this, this astonishing framework in which, uh, you know, as has often been observed in, in literature and other forms, it, it's a memory palace, uh, a way in which we, we capture and, and can maintain uh, certain sets of knowledge in all their complexity, but in a sort of a matter of fact, togetherness that we, that any even non-academic person recognizes that the, the, the living environments that we inhabit that are uh, the product in some cases, but not in all cases of, of actual design are, are, are these, these, these archives in a, in a literal sense. So uh, I, I want to take, you know, I probably only have the remaining 10 minutes or so. Um, it, do I still have 10 minutes? <laughs> How much do I have? Um, yes. Okay, um, I'd like to, to move um, to the actual teaching that I do and that I'll be gearing up uh, in the coming weeks now that I'm back here in Australia to teach again this year to my undergraduate students, um, which uh, as we heard in the introduction, I spent most of my professional career working on, on India with a sort of a self-conscious externality, always trying to look and engage, but understand through, through the, the tactics that I can and through the engagements with colleagues like and now perhaps Pallavi, who I'm coming to know through this webinar, who have a different sort of insight knowledge. But um, I've been teaching here in Australia uh, on the other side of the planet as kind of a, when I came here originally as sort of another Canada, another settler colonial world that, um, that had perhaps more in common with North America than, than its neighborhood here on the edge of Asia, um, as it was often sought to style itself as well as, as another uh, neo-European settler society, um, which uh, has been convenient for making a career in order to, to work on you know, my, my real work in, in India. But uh, I, as I've matured and, and become wiser, I hope, I think I've become more and more acutely aware in, in an increasingly uncomfortable um, uh, new sort of criticality about really thinking more seriously about my settler colonial context, um, which now having gone back to Canada again, it, it's just more and more acutely aware that of course, I've always been a settler colonist. I've always been uh, living and thriving on, on stolen land um, in, in ways that uh, I, I think it's now sort of my, my mature, the, the object of my, mature academic uh, prerogative, vocation perhaps, to make sure that my students, wherever they come from in this very cosmopolitan, global and, and uh, migratory world uh, are aware that you know, we are all sharing and collaborating in the occupation of space one place or another, uh, not just with our other fellow human beings, but with other species, ecosystems, etc. So I'd, I'd like to just use the remaining time I have now to, to, to give you a sample, uh, or to, sorry, I'm moving the wrong thing here, uh, to just look at the introductory uh, thoughts I share with my students in, in, in this course, which we teach in, in the, the third year of our undergraduate program. So what we consider is you know, the, at the capstone part of a history program rather than at the introductory part. We give them a course in modernism um, and contemporary uh, thinking in the, in, in the environmental design professions centered on architecture, but always thinking to landscape architecture and urban design as the broader areas in which our particular program can, can extend them in the master's level. We take them in the second year back um, into a deeper histories, but with an opening up into sort of a parallel curricula that aspires its best to do what Vikram's Global Architectural History Collective aspires to do, and in fact uses that as their textbook. 
Um, so I have the job in the third year, I teach them, I now teach them the first year again, as well as the third year. But in the third year, I, I bring them back to the argument uh, about the, the global through the local. And uh, this is what they haven't done up to that point is actually look closely and critically at their own um, immediate context. So I, um, I offer them this as the very first image that we start this course and I, and I throw as I often do these sort of rhetorical questions. This is the rather extraordinary plan of, of the city of Adelaide in which I now speak to you, from which I now speak to you, which um, although it's now a, a small metropolis, uh, about 1.2 million in size, which uh, is listed in the top 10 top most livable cities in the world. It's very proud of that, that, that attainment it's, it's had. Um, it has in, in contemporary measures as, as a good place to live. Um, I often actually compare it quite a bit to, to Ottawa in some respects. It, it has some similarities. It's a colonial city of much the same vintage. It was established in 1836. And you're literally looking at the plan of the city as it was settled onto the, the topography it was actually fitted to. But as you can see, even from this image, it has um, a lot of um, parallels with, with typical colonial patterned cities um, in North America and elsewhere in, in the world, particularly in the British Empire, um, with some interesting anomalies. We won't go into the, the details of that, but the premise of the course is saying, what can we read from the designs of urban planners, uh, architects and such, and their assumptions about how to make a city in the modern world. We're talking about the early 19th century. It's a, so the course's aim is to, is to look at the making of the modern in a, in a, on a ostensibly a, a tabula rasa, clear, clean slate somewhere in the new world, which uh, is, is imagined and depicted by the painters as this virginal landscape, but and, and which could become this as it did in its first decade or two, um, and which could be cultivated and, and, uh, and rationalized and farmed and made good to bear, bear plenty, which it did in this case, a very successful colonial city, but which of course, presumed uh, and denied in equal measure that uh, the, those who, who were there already um, had done anything good with it at all or had any wherewithal to do that. Uh, and uh, as we saw, some painters would depict uh, who, who were actually occupying the place and their ways of life and how um, this is a, a recent act uh, example of, of, of landscape architectural design that on my own campus we've done as, a, as an act of reconciliation. A rather interesting um, demonstration point with which we begin the course is called the Ghana Learning, Learning Circle. The Ghana people are the native uh, elders and, and uh, custodians of the land on which I am speaking to you now. And in lieu of our Victorian gates, which enclosed our campus and defined this as the place of elite learning, we've removed the gate and, and built this open circle in collaboration with this, uh, the descendants of those people to, to kind of reboot the idea of learning on our campus, at least symbolically, but in an important demonstrative act uh, in terms of spatial unshackling. I, I, of course, I can't give you the whole lecture here. I'm just these are the ingredients. The other most important ingredient or, or, or further important ingredient is, is that others are not just those non-Europeans who occupied the place, who owned the place, who've been here for 60,000 years before Europeans arrived to make a place, make something of it. But those others who participated in the making something of it in the same immediate modern history and who are first uh, instrumental um, threads of the of the complex story that Vikram was sketching about about the inevitable globality of, of any history that we might uh, truly seek to unpack. And this is another important thread of my own research on uh, on Muslim pioneers of colonial Australia going back to the mid 19th century. Um, 
the 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 point I made at the outset that it's all about the present. I I, I like to demonstrate also in, in in this course that it all culminates in for those who are thinking and critical and out there radical architects. It's not just about making crazy forms, but these crazy forms we're looking at are actually the interior of the the National Museum of Australia, which in 2000 when it was built um, was 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 said to be the apex was the in fact the apex of the so-called history wars in Australia where we where we were undergoing uh, our first our latest version of, of the the neoconservative moment in politics when writing or rewriting or, or salvaging the true history of Australia from the white settler colonial point of view was at issue with the post-colonial um, upsetting of it, and here was an, an an opportunity for for radical critical designers to 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 make something of that. We're looking at here a sort of a critical mapping of the nation in terms of a crazy, fun interior space in the in the museum, which which complicates the narrative, to put it simply. Uh, I'm conscious that I'm probably almost out of time here. Uh, I just want to just suggest that these are sort of the key key talking points of a course like this, where we look at cultural landscapes, town and settlement planning, urban infrastructure and engineering, et cetera, all these prosaic things, architectural styles, typologies and meaning, building materials and methods, but try to use each of these lenses to try to upset or complicate the assumptions one might make about the building of a modern city in a place such as this. Um, and finally, uh, the, the course, endeavors at least to, 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 to pursue it with some sincerity, at least two threads, that of uh, Aboriginality and otherness um, as the first thread of the history. And then of course, the one that everyone assumes it's about, which is you know, what, what the modern city has become and why it looks the way it does today, et cetera, um, how these are interwoven. And uh, the, the, theoretically, the way I, I try to do it to make the history of a present in the retelling and each time I teach this course is by trying to interweave these three ideas that it is, of course, in the first instance about a clash of civilization, but not necessarily always about clash, about attempt to kind of communicate um, at least the hope that there was that sense of communication, that, that, that ambition to learn from each other, um, what came of that in, in the conflicts and clashes that did ensue. But the other two key terms are that there's always this prospect in the, in the making of something new uh, and perhaps in fundamentally in the DNA of what we call modernism is that it, it was first and foremost about cultivating in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in an overtly technological way at its height, but always in a sense of possibility of putting knowledge into action in a context to try to innovate or to address a problem as stated and, and, and come up with something that was perhaps novel. Um, for instance, in, in the cultivation of, of a new landscape, the, the, the ambition to, to do what we now think ecologically was a disaster, to, to bring new species to bear and to, to thrive perhaps in a new land, um, and how glass houses and other pieces of architectural technology like that were part of part of that that side of the the prospect of the new, versus the 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 other obvious perhaps overlay of of colonization, which is to to bring and reproduce the culture that dominates. Uh, in this case, at the expense of all that was there, um, and how architecture, of course, serves that purpose as well. These are two humble examples in early. Adelaide of, of, of how that was done as part of the colonial project. And of course, here are the paradigms, uh, the Crystal Palace, the, the British Museum, which, which in, in their, their grand metropolitan way were the, were the models for these two very different uh, fast faces of modernity. The, you know, the, 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 the tool that transformed landscapes and that changed everything we thought was architect or brought entirely new things into architectural imagination and uh, the, the carapace of, of history, the, 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 the sarcophagi of, of, of antiquity, which were there to contain and define and, and symbolize knowledge. So I, I, I will leave that there. I, I, if we, I presume we're out of time, are we, Talavi? Uh, 
Peter, please feel free to go on. I, I think. Well, I just wanted to show one example of a student uh, assignment that just illustrates the way that that will be that wonderful. Was, if that was my intention, these are all the the intentions of the lecturer who says, you know, this will be great. Believe me, this is what I want you to do, and this is what I'm going to show you. That's a very top-down approach. I just want to show you an example of of the bottom-up uh, work that the students do. Um, just one example just would give you some insight into that. Now, hopefully, I'm going to find my directory. Uh, gosh, what's going on here? Oh, I got to unshare this one sec. Okay, stop this. And yes, okay, here we go. I'm just going to open this PDF. So in the methodology of the course in sort of learning by doing, um, what we asked the students to do, if you saw that original map here, you, you recognize the, the, the map of Adelaide. We, we give the students uh, a pair of assignments um, in the first half of the course where they are required. No, sorry. I have to just share that again. Sorry. You're not seeing that. Bear with me. Uh, okay. So I'm going to share the screen. This one here. Okay. Are you seeing this? Pallavi, is that coming through? Yes, Peter. Yeah, okay. So what we're looking at here is, is uh, the, the, the submission by one of the students, incidentally a student who was studying like 30% of our students still were, uh, still are um, from overseas remotely, trying to study at a very, fine grain, the, the local history of the early 19th century in the colonial city of Adelaide. Uh, remarkably, this is possible in our, in our digitized age. The fact that our, our local urban records and state records and such are, are substantially digitized to the extent that students can actually get this from, a, from, from central China. Um, but what, what, what we asked them to do, we, we give each of them uh, one of the empty original square acres of uh, the city of Adelaide as, as, as an idealized colonial template that was, was bought and, and uh, usually in London before they boarded the boat and they came out and they were, they were told eventually when the, when the plan was, was actually surveyed that you know, your acre is now there, go and, go and, and make something of it. And uh, the, the, we asked the students to take to, to study the history of their town acre. And we're looking here at the chronology this student has managed to construct through mining, mining the local archives of, of what has become of that piece of dirt um, as of 2021. Uh, you see down here, the figure ground of the, 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 the acre as it, as it is now occupied. And, they, and going back over these various increments of time, they've do, done their best by interpreting, mining, analyzing, uh, ultimately photographs, but earlier on these amazing uh, bird's eye perspectives that were produced as commercial uh, booster sort of advertorials for the development of the city when it was beginning to become something, some of the, you know, beginning to see that there was prospect for investment and for energy and, and hopes here. And then and students have interpreted even from these early projections of the city as it was coming up what the state of development was at different times through the past century and a half. Um, the, the second part of the assignment um, is to give them, to ask them to take a single building within that acre. Um, and uh, this particular student picked up on some of these er emerging early 20th century commercial properties uh, on their site. And, and then they, they make a detailed um, reconstruction drawing, and then trace the, the, the title deeds of the property to, to find out everybody who's lived in that building and on that site over its socioeconomic history, and thereby use the, the architecture, the choices made of it, the, the purposes it was used for, its, its survival or, or destruction history in some cases, uh, and in some cases it's, it's listing as a heritage building to try to understand 
what is valued, what what was what has changed in the city, uh, to to get a kind of a a very intimate understanding of of the the humanity and and the, and the cultural complexity of of this built fabric. Uh, this is a method I think that is all about being mindful about what we take for granted as the progressivist story of modernism, going back admittedly well before the, the tropes of modern architecture, but we can see where they're coming in into the early 20th century commercial architecture here as well. And also for the student in third year to understand how, how style and, and uh, those um, optics of, of the look of buildings and such were also you know, part of the story of change, part of the story of aspiration and part of ultimately the story of displacement again with, with the arrival of new groups who have different ideas about what to do with that property. This is a, a this is, I'll leave it here. And I've, I thank you for your, your indulgence, giving me a little bit of extra time. Um, so this is an argument for the micro, which I think in, 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 I would argue is, is, is entirely consistent with Vikram's argument from the macro about the, the infinite complexity of, of, of any proposition of a global perspective on, on this thing we call modernism. Let's proceed to the discussion. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much, both of you, Vikram and Peter. That, that was um, a very interesting set of presentations. So thank you again for that. Um, I would encourage the audience, if you have any comments or questions, please put it in the chat and we'll take it up from there. But uh, just to in initiate our conversation, I, I, when I look at both of your presentations, I think of Peter, when you were talking about how you wrote about Indian uh, history and modernism, post-colonial modernism in India, and you being almost an external looking in into that situation, um, so this idea of time, location, the idea of scale and distance, what are you looking at? Is it a micro history? Is it a uh, you know, global history? If they can be used uh, in that sense. Uh, and then Vikram, you're, you're writing about your father, an architect, um, but also you're writing in, in the Western world and your audience then becomes external. Um, to what you're writing about in, in the sense. So there is that external factor that I feel uh, comes in, in both your works, but in a different sense. Uh, how, how do you think about that? And what kind of a challenge does that face in either case when you're writing um, primarily, I mean, the, your audience, your, your circle, um, Vikram would be primarily a Western audience versus Peter, you're writing about uh, the Indian or the East uh, being from the West. How does that change the dynamics? Um, I, I, if I may, I, I'll begin um, because uh, again, this long career, long conversation I've been having with Vikram, he, he more often than not reminds me that uh, you know that the the value of what I'm doing is not for that external audience, it's it's for the students, particularly in India, that, you know, we need to write it, what we do in a way that they'll actually read, they'll be able to read and engage with. And, and I've, I've really found that helpful, um, certainly in, hopefully in my later work, if not the earlier work, uh, that I've had that in my mind and, and, and tried my best, I'm not sure I've succeeded, but um, that that that's who I really want to reach. And, and perhaps it's because I, I have this, this acutely self-aware sense of externality, but I've had the privilege in my long engagement with India to, to actually have more mobility, more of kind of a medium macro perception of what I see going on between the different schools that I'm very familiar with, with, with across all, all pretty much all of the regions of India that I've made a point of uh, traveling through lightly and with my special interest in observing the architectural patterns of development as such and, and the, the pattern of debate and discussion. I've always had that sort of sense that I have a sort of, a, and I, my colleagues seem to suggest that they have that, that awareness that, that the, the local students need to know. They, they're either attempting to understand at a distance, you know, the, the global discourse somewhere entirely different, or they're totally caught up in a very local understanding of the situation in their own school, for instance. 
without that that in between perspective, which I, I think I, I I've aspired to to connect and particularly in, in the more mature work to to bring my awareness of an occasional global discourse that that you know comes in and goes out you know and tries to make a splash about something it thinks is is interesting or or uh, publishable that month in some international journal it's happening in India then of course they they drop the ball and don't come back for 10 years I've been able to look at that pattern of attention and awareness about what's hot and what's not from those external points of view but 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 connected uh, the discourses inside India and that's sort of perhaps the value of that sense of distancing that, that hopefully has kept me critically useful. Um, I suspect, you know, the Vikram, the uh, writing with that consciousness that you need to understand dif India differently than people like Scriber would write about it. Um, you, you take over from here. I, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't know, Peter. Uh, you know, a fascinating set, set of uh, present, uh, you know, the things you showed, Peter, provoked a lot of thought, but Pallavi's question, uh, so I teach and live and teach in Seattle. And uh, one of my curious experiences coming and teaching in the United States was one of the first things I was asked was to teach the history of the architecture of India. Uh, whereas I was a school of scholar of modernism and post-colonial theory and deconstruction. So you know, the reverse of being an external is being a native informant. Uh, and, uh, and then there is the question of, uh, of uh, you know, a relationship to land. Now, uh, we have, uh, I have this Office of Uncertainty Research and we have done a, started a land acknowledgement project there as well. Uh, and so it's a complex thing, you know, what is my relationship to white settler culture in America? So if I'm to uh, carry, since I am benefiting from white settler culture in Seattle, if I'm therefore to assume white settler uh, responsibilities, uh, then I also don't have to explain myself as an outsider then. So, and then similarly, if I'm to contrast me writing in Chandigarh from, let's say, Peter, I grew up, I was born and brought up in Chandigarh, okay, fine. Uh, Peter is not born and brought up in Chandigarh, but he's writing about Chandigarh. What's the difference? I don't know. I mean, I'm an outsider, true. I mean, Chandigarh as such, as a fact, is already an externality. And this is, in that sense, not that different from Adelaide. Uh, it's a sort of an imposition on uh, on uh, on on a highly layered site, right? Even its production, 1947 India. Uh, when you look, so my mother tells me the story that one day uh, a man came to our house in Sector Eight in the heart of city uh, and said, "You know, this house where you have a very uh, learned man used to live." because we have a temple right behind our house. So, uh, you know, we look, so we, have, we are already settler colonial. We pushed people out to live over there. But as I looked into that history, I also learned that, you know, the Muslims were pushed out of the villages from where Chandigarh was built in 1947 because of the partition. And so, you know, there are places that are, the, that are in the preserved villages. You go there, it's clearly a mosque but nobody refers to it as a mosque. They say, oh, it's just a community center, uh, uh, which, has been, which has been repurposed. So it's, the history is, is, is a really complicated thing in this sense, and, and authors and authority is, is, is I would argue, uh, mindfulness requires not the easy getaway of justification that I now recognize myself as an external. That's too easy in my perspective. Uh, mindfulness is about uh, knowing, observing, and uh, developing some kind of a, I don't know, 
you know, I would even argue dispassionate, uh, engaged distance from the complexities of the ebbs and flows. And I think the way to uh, then engage it is what Peter also started to bring up. And I think is, is, is the way is, you know, you recognize that everything is very personal, right? The history is always very personal. Uh, and, it, and it's a strange thing. Um, yes, I just finished this book on my father. I'm very excited to hear Peter's looking at his archive. I don't know, I'm looking forward to the book that's gonna come out of, <laughs> out of this <laughs> research. Some, something will happen. I don't know what it is going to be, but, but but it's an interesting thing for me because right now, as I'm speaking over here, right below me is my mother, who was who who was in Chandigarh 1952 to 1928, 2022, 2020, two years ago, but now is living and she's in hospice care. She's gonna basically she's gonna die in my home here in Seattle even at the precise moment when we are selling the house in Chandigarh, which, you know, which has deep high modernism roots, uh, Indian national modernism, you know, roots uh, in, in, in Chandigarh. So, so uh, you know, so I'm, I'm been doing this project where it describes this house that I'm sitting in, in terms of this land acknowledgement project uh, and sort of displacing it and replacing it by this house in Chennai, both of which have extremely complicated history, uh, which I would argue uh, are just as entangled as the history of the house that Peter is sitting in, in Adelaide, uh, which is how you should present uh, that whole Adelaide discussion as a genealogy of your own house, right? I mean, what else is it? Uh, mm. uh, so, so, so external and internal, I think is a really complicated story. And I think it's, and I'll just say, you know, while I'm extremely supportive of, and I do all the land acknowledgements and argue for them, sometimes I feel like they're just a too easy uh, escape yeah. hatch. It can definitely be that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I think that, that's while you were talking about that and while i looked at you know you're talking about one continuous line i was thinking of uh, micro history and ginsburg and this whole idea that you know when uh, according to him um how does one life help to understand world history and then looking at peter's examples where you're showing the that timeline that the students have built and bringing out that complexity I, going back to the idea that probably both of you touched upon, uh, but in, in terms of, uh, in uh, the words of Vikram, the presence of the present in the past. Mm -hmm. I, I yeah. was really attracted right. to that. Um, maybe Vikram and Peter, both of you, if you can expand a little bit more on that. It would be very interesting. Yeah, I'd be happy to, you know, in, very simply in, in, in the courses that I teach, like Peter, you know, I insist on that, you know, is to not to see the past and the present, which is a sort of an old hat, old hat idea, uh, but to insist that uh, all that we think of as contemporary and modern in different ways is always, is, is, has, has been uh, uh, not prefigured, but has been repeated in the Nietzschean sense. Uh, so many times before. So which makes us as archaic as, as we are modern. Uh, so we are we are producing uh, uh, the same things. So that's essentially, essentially that idea. And what that does is, you know, Peter, you were talking about what is the present, right? What is the present? Uh, yeah, you were. Uh, is it the past? And the, what's the relationship between the present and, and mindfulness is all about being present in the present, right? Which is a very interesting thing. Uh, but if you look at that question historiographically, uh, 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 and how we teach it, you know, as Peter is talking about the assignments and so on, uh, 
the, the present is as much. See, if the if the if the if the present is as much the past, then the future is in the present as much as it is not here yet, right? So 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 this this is a very uh, so what's the relationship between that, in a sense, ontology, if you like, I'm going to claim it ontology, not as epistemology. I'm going to, if that's the ontology of the world, the reality of the world, then, then what, it's a good question for me. Like, what is a, a, what would be history writing as in the present? Uh, we can abstract out of it and say, well, if I'm only in the present, the past and the future just whoosh, fade away. But if we see the present as completely imbricated with only the past and the future, then it chases a, offers a uh, amazing challenge to the mindful project, mindfulness project. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I don't know if I have anything I can add to that because it's uh, you, you've taken us into very, <laughs> very important uh, and uh, tricky terrain here. Um, I suspect my statements were more simplistic than that earlier on. Um, it's just sort of a ever seeking to bring uh, this as a you know, riffing on the words that today's event has, has encouraged me to do, uh, but they, that was useful. I've always talked about histories about the present. Uh, and, I, and in fact, I think I'm talking about history writing, therefore historiographies about the present, about finding the questions of now that make it meaningful, make it useful to, to look again at uh, stories we thought we might know or ones we have never bothered to be interested in before, which are there in the in in a, in a, a an evident or emergent historicity of certain facts of the past um, that we can learn from, because they're actually present and and burning questions. Very often, uh, particularly in our society today, driven by what will be useful next. You know, why is this valuable for our future? Mm. When what's going to be the impact of that? Instrumentalized, yeah, yeah. You know, which is an obsession of our of our times. Um, uh, particularly for mean. the deans and the beans counter. Yes, yes. Well, uh, particularly in our institutional lives, you know, <laughs> to, to our to our ad nauseum and and, and dismay. Uh, but if you can at least see that, yeah, it's always worth sort of, um, looking again to see what what more stories that uh, those artifacts of the past can tell us. Um, it is ultimately about understanding our present because it's, it, it, it's all part of the, the base of knowledge, which is, and I like to think from a point of view of our disciplines as, as people are teaching in a professional sense, the, the, the design, the, the, the vocation of making that environment, they were always creating, uh, contributing to the incremental accretion of this material uh, archive, this, this, these memory palaces that that you know we will have cause to look at, interrogate again in the future to understand what what's in there already. What what problems have we perhaps already addressed that we can see in in a new light? So it's a it, it, it's a well let's not go into into futurology, but uh, but def definitely understanding what the questions we have now that that may be different from other ones, or or occasionally recognizing that the questions we have now, of course, they did. That's I think what you were saying, Vikram. You know. It would, the presence was always there uh, in, in, in the past. That they, There were questions then that were urgent that, that were addressed with the decisions that were made by designers to build something a certain way for a certain reason, which, which met the, the, their needs then that we, we've now lost sight of perhaps, uh, that we can, we can learn uh, again about if, if it's relevant to the questions we have today. I tend to do it very personally, you know, Peter, uh, you know, many times I think, you know, I'm I'm uh, I'm 58 years old, and then I do the math on what year was it that my father was 58 years old. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, we do that, don't we? Yes, 
and and I try and remember him at that point. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, and I don't know what that does for me. I mean, my therapist has a few perspectives on this, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but from a mindful perspective, and this this time question that you that we are debating here, uh, uh, you know. Uh, it, it seeks to ask, you know, in a micro micro way, what is the relationship between the the fact and agency, my fact and agency in the present, and its past, but as if that past was present today. You know, I I, ima- I, I kind of imagine what my father would do if he was me here today. Hmm. I think Vikram, that is such a poignant point because this idea of uh, you thinking about your father when he was 58 years old versus you as a child looking up to him and it's all that overlap. I think a very phenomenological kind of what is called the thick present uh, where you're talking about the past, but also you know, you're know you in the present, but thinking about a future book, maybe um, all combined together. It's the book probably that made you think of those things in that way. So I think it- It's the other way around. I wrote that book to try and make this habit go away. <laughs> <laughs> I see. <laughs> well, it's a, I'll offer another little insight that, that literally last week when I was with my father, who's now 92 and, um, at the, the 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 late end of, uh, of of Parkinson's disease, where he is losing his cognitive faculties, he was a brilliant academic uh, in his time, um, and and many more things. Uh, and I've been pulling things out of the family archives in the basement, and literally going to him at his best moments in his day after his nap when he's more lucid and, and saying, look, we found this. Do you remember that time? And of course, well, as an older person, of course the memories of older times are, tend to be more lucid than, than what happened that morning. Um, but it's, it's been fascinating kind of in real time, Vikram actually, you know, going back to those moments <laughs> where I remember I have a childhood or a, or a young adult memory of one or another of these things that uh, we shared that, that, that I found important. I've pulled it selectively from the, all of the stuff that my mother's stressing over what to do with, et cetera. Um, and saying, well, I remember that and I'll just take that to tea with dad today and see what he says. And, and you know, we bring back those moments in his own way, but, you know, it's quite exciting every once in a while just to see what he, he does remember and, and, and how, it, it seemed to give a little value to him in his in his very late life now, uh, but it, it it reverberates back certainly through me who's still lucid somewhat <laughs> and uh, and 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 able to think about it and and actually remind other family members that you don't re- remember that but you know that thing actually was really valuable for what I know of him and what I've known of him and. So we'll, you know, we, we'll set aside that, or we'll think about that. I think a little bit more, and you know, that that's meaningful. But it, it, I could just start to say, in the moment, in the present, you know, it was actually, it gave more value to his his somewhat, you know, greatly diminished days now, um, in 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 the present. So it was fascinating how sort of history is sort of working for us in this in this very present way. Um, and yeah, but it, it and I just say, you know, it, it helped having just. Like your book, Vikram, before before I left, <laughs> um, yeah, because you know I, I was I was in that in that space, you know, looking forward to this opportunity. Right. Well, an- another question that I've been thinking of, and more of an observation, is it uh, the idea of history and the publication of history, and what kind of publisher publishes your book and. Vikram, I especially no, noticed that uh, con- one continuous line has been published uh, by Mapen, and hmm. um, while others are with other publishers. And is there a story behind that? Behind Mapen? Behind, yeah. Mapen is a well-known story. Peter started it. I'm continuing it. That's all there is to it. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, Vikram is still working with the same the same actual <laughs> publisher, the Pippin <laughs> Shaw, you know, who's who is that 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 publisher who 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 committed for his own good business reasons. He used to be the distributor for MIT uh, in India and, and and began his career in the states. Was was an electrical engineer or something. Was there for ten years. Came back, started that press uh, in the eighties. Um, knowing that there was a change in the in the financial rules where you could you could do better for printing quality etc with the rules the way they were shifting at that moment and he said there's an opportunity there it's just it was his coming home moment and you know he's never looked back but he, he focused on on getting uh, you know intelligent design and craft writing happening in an accessible way that was the the mantra and he would get a product that the, the five-star hotels would sell. So he actually sold in larger volume than we would expect from an academic publisher. So you had to kind of wear the cost that he wanted to ideally produce a, in a good looking coffee table book. Rick and I wanted to try to do something that was higher brow and he kind of met us halfway. And that's that's been the kind of the model of that press and they, they've done it well. And now Vikram, you're, you're the actual consulting editor for, for yeah. their architectural list, aren't you? Yeah. Yes, yes. So that's that's good. But somebody, Cameron, has a question in the chat. Yes, and uh, Kurt, uh, Kurt, also, if you have any uh, questions, please go ahead. I'll uh, take up the question in the chat in a little bit. Thanks, Pallavi. Um, the, the conversation, I think, is very fascinating. Both presentations, I thought, you know, were very insightful and bring up to me kind of two areas about history. Like, you know, when we normally talk about history, we talk about, you know, some sort of telling of, you know, past events about how do we understand it, how do we put it forward. So, and Peter, you, your project with the students, I thought was very interesting, where you give them a chunk of land and they go, you know, to, you know, the a city hall and track down, you know, all the title information and things like that. It just kind of stresses the importance of, you know, keeping that document right like one aspect of you know history is to have that material to be able to access right but we need that sort of database that sort of collection and then the idea that you know every generation or you know, anytime we kind of engage with that material, we're writing kind of our own narrative, right? So the idea of having that material available for whomever really wants to get a hold of it to be able to create, you know, looking through that material, create their own narrative and create their own sort of, you know, story that they want to tell. I guess my question would be in that context, how do you create that sort of reliable, you know, subject of narration? you know, in the sense that it doesn't slip into maybe a personal opinion or a bias or, you know, kind of a singular perspective. How do you make sure that it is, you know, just, you know, kind of a, a mono narrative or something that might be more reflective? Are there gradations? Are there sort of levels to, how would you begin to understand that sort of, you know, in defining the subjective in a sort of historical situation? Um, is that to me or to both of us? Yeah. To both of you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Please. Um, well, I, I guess, the, of course, in, in the teaching situation with that, uh, that's the opportunity for the for the teaching and the assessment of the quality of the work is to sort of say, well, you know, you, you, you simply just mimed the, the, the information and there's no interpretation there at all. If they over-interpret where, where they don't actually have an evidence based on it, you sort of remind them that, you know, it has to arise from, the plausible interpretation of the evidence that you, you've got there. In the best cases, they they will they will look at the evidence base, but they'll also you know attempt to look at some of the secondary literature and and uh, in, in the, the absolute best cases become critical, discerning about about how reliable some of the secondary literature that's it's that's interpreted similar material before has actually been in in reading what's actually what they've actually perceived. You know, they they might discover in the case that they randomly get assigned that there's there's something interesting and anomalous about it that doesn't fit the narrative so if, if you sort of see that they're they're actually recognizing that in their in their little student you know mini essays and such that they write around this material then you know, we get excited um, but at, at 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 least we we we're happy to see that they they figure out how to how to source the material and and not just take it for it is what it is you know they own that property and that's that it's a legal fact and 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 that's it, which is what the record exists for. 
um, but that they that they can read in more. We asked them particularly to look at you know, the socioeconomic change in the, in the ownership of that property in context like Adelaide, particularly the inner city gentrification is, is, is the phenomenon like you'd expect in any other very livable city uh, in the Western world. Um, so, so things that were very humble in their day you know, are, 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 are seen from the property market to be very valuable and in a way that distorts, would distort the perception of the student is not looking closely at, at, at what, what, it actually, what the evidence actually tells you about how, who lived there originally and, and how modest their means were, et cetera. That's yeah, my answer. You have something to add to that, Vikram? About the, yes, the, yes. Uh, you know, this is a <clears throat> objectivity versus sort of subjective production. You know, Pallavi is interested in narrative and mm -hmm. stories in history. Uh, and uh, Peter described some of the techniques that I use, you know, different fonts and italicizations and so on to sort of produce a some kind of a performance of that problem. But the problem quite clearly from my perspective is in the production of objectivity and subjectivity as oppositions, as if one was, as if that is how things were, that yet it's either this or that. I think from experience, most of us know that that's not true. And that uh, the truth, if you like, uh, in scare quotes, is, is uh, you know, not even something in between, but something other. All right. uh, and the purpose of the historiographical project for me is both producing narratives that uh, embody this other and also at the same time search for this other. Because the subject object opposition is historiographically produced. It didn't fall from heaven. It's, it's a certain construction of certain things, you know, let's say 19th century. Uh, so, so there is other ways of doing which is possible. And, and indeed, uh, I would argue necessary and urgent. Which brings us to this question of consensus that uh, Cameron asked. I think, I, I, you know, I want to sort of jump. If it's okay, Pallavi, I'll, I'll sort of uh, take it. Yes, please. Uh, Vikram, would you mind reading the question? Because not everyone probably can see that. But... Okay. Uh, a recurring theme to these discussions of a growing awareness that the modern project has ended and another epoch is emerging, right? If historian, if historian, if the historian is no longer an objective observer, what will be the new consensus? He asks. So he says, what is going to happen if we give up on object, object, objective observation because that theoretically produces uh, consensus? So my my thinking over there is that obviously what we have learned is that there never was consensus that there never was objective history anyway. And that what was perceived as consensus was already written in through a series of nods uh, rather than uh, uh, congealing around facticity or objectivity. It was more a series of nods across, uh, uh, let's say historians at conferences for lack of a better, you know, stand in for the processes of political formation. So given that, the question is not whether we will lose consensus. The question is, how can we actually produce better consensus? And when we will never really attain the horizon of, you know, uh, whatever it is, perfect consensus, nobody wants that. Uh, but how can we actually produce a real better consensus, which therefore has to work with inevitable difference and misunderstanding as part of its production? So that, you know, is, is, is my thinking about that question uh, and the work I think that Peter and myself and others, a lot of historians uh, and thinkers uh, are doing uh, is in yeah. service of that, yeah. I'll, yeah, let me. I, I'm really glad you made that point because uh, 
time and again in, in my career, and particularly in terms of not the professional <laughs> academic side of it, but just living today in our political world <laughs> with the, the collapse of belief in many quarters in the, you know, the viability of democracy and such. It's hard. <laughs> it's hard. Consensus, if that's another word for reaching agreement around difficult policy decisions or decisions of any sort in life in a complex society is never going to be easy. And in fact, just maybe our job has just been to emphasize, we say it too simple, too often and too, too uh, passively, just, you know, it's complex or it's complicated, but thickening or complicating the, the questions is, is what, what we've devoted our work to doing. And, and I think we firmly believe that it's worth doing because we all have to just work a lot harder to 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 come up to to uh, something that's uh, practically closer to a theoretical consensus, because that is the noble and 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 middle path to pursue in the world of of knowing and 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 making some decisions that we need to take. We're not going to reach some sort of Valhalla thing where, yes, where, where one side wins and the other loses. It's not, you know, you're with us or against us. It's not, it's not the, the triumph of one worldview versus another. Um, it's, it's, it's the difficult, very difficult and ultimately creative struggle to reach a middle ground. Uh, I, I, I believe that profoundly, and that's, I think, why... I'm not really a theorist in the end, I'm, a, I'm an historian. You know, I, I, that's where I, I thrive as a thinker and it's very frustrating to anyone, particularly my undergraduates who say, you know, you, you took an hour to not get to the point. What was the point of all that? <laughs> you know, uh, that's, that's the student feedback from the ones who don't get it or who are not there, you know, who, who want the quick route to the degree to do the thing that they, thought they already knew they were going to get when they started. You know, I succeed as a teacher if, if I throw them off their feet and they don't know what the answer is yet. They just know it's going to be hard and it's going to take a better part of their lifetime to get there. But, you know, if, if we can use your word, if, we, if I've made them more mindful of that, I hope, I, I think I've, I'm succeeding and I'm being true to what I, what I understand, humble as that might be about what I've been working on. Yeah. That's beautifully said. And I think a, a repositioning of history in academics, this whole, I, I think we need a prerequisite to a history course where you need to understand that there is not a, or not the history, but a history. I think that point that you brought out, Peter, has also stuck with me um, very prominently. There's another question in the chat from Susan Dickey, and she asks, in light of the Shoah, can we morally be post-history? there is real danger of idealizing the present as occurred in German high modernism. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, uh, uh, spot on, no. I mean, that's, that's, that's what Holocaust studies uh, are all about, is not forgetting. I mean, and that in a word is history. Um, but I guess what we would add, what I would humbly add to that is it, it, it has to be a, a, a constant scholarship that keeps uh, thickening the, the understanding of that and, and, and all the other horrific histories that humans have perpetrated upon each other. It's difficult stuff, but uh, we need to understand, you know, ultimately how I think anyone is culpable in their own makeup of, of committing similar atrocities. Um, if we don't understand the makings, that's why I'm so fearful of our moment now. I mean, I, it just astonishes me to see how close the current mechanics of, of the political world we're living in at the moment around the planet is, is, is veering back to the 1930s. Um, it, it's just very worrisome. So, I mean, history couldn't be more important to us to the present than, than the present. As we see it now, but of course, what Bickham was saying, it, it's always about the present um, and, and about the presence of the, <laughs> of the present. 
in in the in the thinking of that. I just wish we would recognize it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Vikram, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I can. I mean, uh, two short observations. You know, uh, no, no. Just I don't. You know, it's something I'm, I'm preparing to write something on on the show. It's it's a complex thing. Uh, and similarly, like I'm preparing to write on land acknowledgement. You know. And you talk about being external to a certain extent, and I'm an external to both these things, right? I mean, it's like India, grew up in India, post-colonial history, you know, I, I didn't know about the show, I, you know, we weren't involved. So, uh, uh, so that's so a certain extent, but then of course you start looking a little more carefully, you know, you, 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 you find a lot of entanglements. Mm. Um, and then that raises the question of, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm trying, still trying to figure out how to, how to articulate uh, something about this. Uh, but, but what Peter has brought up is that one of the problems with, with making the Holocaust, this not to be forgotten event in history is that it sort of distances it you know, it's like, you know, the Nazis there, then Germany in 1933, whatever, right? Whereas the fact of the matter is, you know, the conditions that produced that were vastly beyond the, the Nazis and are not gone away. They're still yeah. here. And it's not like they've suddenly sprung up out of nowhere. And they've always been here. Uh, so, uh, so our entangle, so it's, it's, that's, that's, you know, how does one theorize that this is really important, uh, because it, uh, it tends to be in this sort of, uh, kind of as a localized event, something went wrong for me has always felt as if that is produced as the idea that something went wrong, fortunately we overcame it through American might and bombs and the A-bomb and, and whatever else we did. And we must not repeat it rather than, uh, and that Western civilization therefore survived, thankfully, mm -hmm. uh, rather, than, rather than something else. Very interesting. Um, it makes me, again, Peter, what you brought up and Vikram, you were talking about it, this idea of the difference between a theorist and a historian, then does it start to merge or is, becomes more evident uh, in what you're talking about? Well, Vic Vikram this just... is where Peter and I are going to disagree a little bit, I think. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh... <laughs> It's actually my 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 previous uh, um, exchange with Roger Kona um, three three years back or so when I spoke in in another context in India uh, at his invitation that um, I I came around to 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 speaking to and you know reflecting a bit like Vikram did with some of his books on 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 how I'd approach certain things through through the chronology of my time and. Uh, our generation, yeah, I guess I'd speak to Vikram and myself, um, have been strongly influenced and inspired by, by theory with a big T, as I discuss it in that other piece. Um, and, and certainly that was my aspiration to, to, to contribute to that. Um, I think i just more humble to say I've, I've done it by way of telling stories and, and recognizing with more and more conviction and, and comfort that I, I'm, I'm an historian after all. I think it was my own mentor uh, in my PhD who kind of arrived at that conclusion rather early on and with some disappointment said, well, you know, you're, you're not a theorist, but now we know you're an historian. So, you know, let's just get done with it and, <laughs> and, and be at peace with that. Uh, of course, I, the, the, the theoretical 
inclination uh, or predisposition to want to kind of come up with some description about what what sort of pattern seems to be emerging from what you're observing is always there. That's how that's how we 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 posit arguments, how we build arguments. But I guess I'm I'm not sure I'm I'm going to be the one to um, to 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 build an argument that 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 has my name on it <laughs> that that is a, a theory per se, but rather you know a a theoretical predisposition that that. It is looking to try to understand things not as as random, not as not as um, as um, yeah. yes, uh, just simply uh, beyond anyone's control. I mean, we we can learn from the patterns that that emerge and 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 attempt to think about them um, seriously to sort of avoid or learn from what what. What history tells us comes around. Okay. Be about as far as I would go. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. History theory, the from my perspective is just, you know, the uh, yeah, chicken not, and egg. They're not chicken and egg. Again, it's one of these false oppositions. You know, it's uh, yeah. it's set up in that way, and then you know you got to pick sides. If I have to pick sides, I'll pick with Peter. I'm happy to be a, on the his side of historians. But mm -hmm. you know, this is because we are playing in a in, in a park, and you know we got to play the soccer game. So I'll pick that side <laughs> <laughs> because my right. friends are there. Uh, but in fact. Uh, uh, but in fact, uh, it's, it's, you know, I can't imagine writing anything, not even two sentences that aren't sort of figured in some way. Yeah, even, exactly. even what fact you pick from that archives, your students pick, Peter. Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, what is it? Is it a Google search they're doing? You know, what is it that, that, that figures their production of fact? Yeah. Uh, it's a stance, you know. You, 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 and and that's our job is to is to get them aware that they they are inevitably, and that comes back to the subjectivity. It's it's we don't need to use the word subjective versus uh, objective. Yeah. It's just simply uh, a a stance. So a, that's a more Bourdieuian term, you know. You you you're like a soccer player on the field. You've got a position. <laughs> you, you're, you're in that position. You may be playing that's a, right. a winger. Yeah. You may be. A, I'm I'm left center. Or, 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 whatever, but you, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and it, 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 yeah, yeah, so. and you can become very good at that, or you might aspire to change your position, which might give you a new perspective on the ball. But yeah, you're <laughs> you're in the game. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's we can continue our discussions because each topic that we are talking about brings in more and more, um, and we are at our uh, probably the mark at which we should end. Uh, this very fascinating conversation, but doesn't end here. I'm hoping we will be able to take it up in different ways uh, in future collaborations. Uh, but thank you again, Vikram and Peter, and to everyone here, Kurt, uh, and I are very thankful uh, to have been part of this conversation. And please do not forget, we have our last um, webinar coming up uh, for uh, next Saturday. And that'll be uh, the final webinar for Mindful Modernisms. And then uh, we are hoping to continue this in the form of a, a publication, hopefully. So thank you both, Peter and Vikram. Any closing um, comments that you may have? Just just my thanks for the invitation. And I, I'm, I'm relieved that I was able to honor it, um, which is a hopeful note. It seems like a COVID Defined world is 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 evolving as we speak, and uh, it's getting easier to to not find a find a new normal, I suppose. Which hopefully won't be just back to business as before, but as we've all reflected lots, I'm sure in in recent times that we've we've learned a lot by by the the, the shifts in circumstances that we've all experienced, and uh, it was timely, perhaps, uh, to to have a chance to speak to your your webinar on this occasion. So. Thanks for reaching out. Thank yes, you. thank you, thank you. Thank you, both of you. And thank you for all the organizers and the university and sponsors. And thank you for Zoom. That has enabled <laughs> Yes. <you. laughs>
And thank you to COVID, which has enabled this. Uh, we probably would never have done things like this. That's right, I know. It's just, that's so true. COVID and Zoom, uh, even though we are all Zoomed out and ready to protect <laughs> ourselves, uh, it, it, it does have a certain value which has been added. So thank you for the invitation. Thank you both Vikram and Peter. I just wanted to mention it's because of the time difference, the, um, uh, Roger is in UK and so it's probably like after midnight for him. So he could not join us in this conversation but we have to had to find some time that we could have both of you because you are in Seattle, you're in, in Adelaide and we are here in Canada. So, it, but Roger uh, is, he, he will be watching this and uh, we'll have more conversations. Hopefully, I'm looking forward to that as well. Okay. Good. Well, Did you, you add any? To hear from you. Thanks. And just thanks want to say thanks to both of you. Yeah, for joining us on a wonderful conversation. And just a reminder to our audience: uh, the next uh, webinar is entitled uh, "A New Intimacy: Liminal Spaces of Generosity, Interiors, and Interiority." Uh, so mm -hmm. that will be the uh, the final discussion. Uh, so please join us in that. Be at a regular morning time, uh, 9 a.m. next Saturday. And thanks again, Vikram. Thank you again, Peter, for a wonderful discussion and joining our little webinar series. Thank thanks. you.